Today, we are going to continue looking in our study of the book of Acts, and, and what I want to do as we continue today is talk about something that has been weighing on me for, for months, and I know for many of you as well. Um, October the 7th of last year, you might remember, uh, it was all over the news, it was all over everything, um, a, a terrorist organization called Hamas orchestrated an incursion across a sovereign country's border and killed 1,200 people plus and took hundreds of hostages. Uh, and this week you saw uh, several of those be rescued, uh, which, was, which was great. There's still over 100 people who are in captivity uh, as, as hostages. And uh, having been to Israel so many times, having so many friends in that part of the world, this is, this is heavy, and you know that. Um, for the last uh, nearly nine months now, I have watched something that is not new in the world. Um, but it is certainly a little more blatant than I can recall seeing it in my lifetime. Uh, and that is anti-Semitism. Um, the, the, the number of things that have been said and done uh, in so many different venues in so many different places have been incredibly difficult to hear. I have, I have many friends uh, who are Jewish. I have many Israeli friends. I have many Palestinian friends. And I just have to tell you that like, the, the things that I have heard said are horrifying. And so often they're said in ignorance. People don't know exactly what it is they're saying. They're just like mouthing things that they've heard. And they don't understand the historical roots of some of these things. It does not make them any less painful. Uh, it doesn't make them any less hurtful. And I've, I've just heard this again and again and again. And we come to this section of the book of Acts. And the reason I bring this up is because what we're going to see today is that this is nothing new. That this was true in the first century, just like it's true, it's true today. Anti-Semitism is not new. Uh, it, is, it is horrible, it is ugly, and it is not Jesus. And if there's any question about that, please come see me at the Green Tent, and I would love to have a conversation with you about that. Because there is no way to reconcile anti-Semitism and following Jesus. I don't know any way to be clearer than that. You can't do that. It's not allowed. It's not Jesus. And, and what we're going to see today is, is ancient evidence of, of something that happened that fits into the vein of what we see and hear a lot today. Uh, let's pick up where we left off last time in Acts chapter 16. As we were going to the place of prayer, who's we? <laughs> As always, we pick up in the middle, right? We, this is, this is Paul, this is Silas, and this is Luke, right? And they're on this second missionary journey. They're going in, they're in Philippi. We left them there last time. Philippi, the first place that the gospel is proclaimed in Europe. They've crossed over into Europe, they're in Philippi, and the first convert, the first follower of Jesus, who says yes to the offer of Jesus, was a woman named Lydia, who when she accepted Jesus, she opened her home, and this actually becomes the host site for the church there in Philippi. Big deal, Philippi is a Roman colony, mostly Romans there, not a very large Jewish population, and Lydia opens her home, and this becomes the first church. She's a leader in this early church. So as Paul and his team were going to the place of prayer, they were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. Now, English translations, I don't think, do a great job of translating this. It says a spirit of divination. What it actually says in the text is a python spirit, right? Now, if you've been here for a minute, you know that I'm not a fan of things that crawl around with no legs, okay? Uh, not at all, okay? So this says that she has a python spirit. Immediately, I'm done. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'm out. I'm out. We're finished. Not okay. This had a very specific historical context, and I want to I unpack this for just a minute. Uh, python was a, a nomenclature that was given to one of the gods called Apollo that the, the, uh, the Romans worshipped. Apollo had apparently, in the mythology, slain a dragon named Python, and this became one of his titles, Python. And Apollo had a temple, his most famous temple, in fact, in antiquity, 
was in a place called Delphi, right? And some of you may remember reading in your history books uh, about the oracle at Delphi, right? It's one of the most famous oracles in antiquity. Well, the oracle at Delphi was actually a priestess who was called a pythoness. That's about the worst title I can imagine having, but she was a pythoness because the spirit of Python is what enabled her to give these oracles to tell the future, in theory. What Luke says, we're met by a slave girl who had a Python spirit. Okay? So this is likely, based on our understanding of the text, this is likely a demonic spirit, right? And it is speaking through her. It is in her and speaking through her and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. They see her as a business opportunity and she's a slave. So she has to do what they say. She has no freedom. And this is what's going on. And they encounter her, Paul and the team, and she followed Paul and the rest of the team crying out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Well, that's true. That's 100% true. Interestingly, referring to God as the most high God is not something you see often in the New Testament. In fact, there's only a handful of places where you see it. One of those is with a man who was demon-possessed that Jesus encountered, who referred to God as the most high God. Interesting connection there. She's following them, crying this out all the time. Now, it's true. But I want you to imagine somebody following you around and yelling out to everybody around who you are all the time. Is that going to get old? Or you might, you might get a little annoyed? She kept doing this for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. I think he was just, he had it like, that was, was it. And, and it came out that very hour. Get out. And, and the demon did. When her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. What is this about? Why are they so angry? What's it about? Money. It's about money. They just lost their opportunity to exploit this girl. And that's not okay with them. Wait a minute. How dare you? So they dragged them before the rulers in the marketplace. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. This is interesting. To understand this, you've got to back up just a wee bit, and you've got to understand that the Jewish religion was very unique in that it was allowed by the Romans. The, the Romans did not allow a whole lot of foreign deities to be worshipped in their empire. Right? The Roman religion was a plethora of gods, many, many gods. And if you didn't worship all the gods, if you only worshipped, say, one god, they had a word for you. You're an atheist because you deny the existence of all the other gods. And that's not okay. By this point in history, there had begun to rise in the government system a new cult called the emperor cult where you would worship the emperor as a god. Now, it wasn't fully developed at this point in history, but it was pretty strong. And so if you only worship one god, that means you're not worshiping all the Roman gods. It also means you're not worshiping the emperor. Well, this won't do. Because if you're not worshiping the emperor, then you're not fully committed to the government. And if you're not fully committed to the government, you can't be trusted. The Jews were given an exception. And this goes all the way back to Herod the Great, who got that exception for them. He got that exception that allowed the Jews to worship as they will if they would offer a sacrifice on behalf of the emperor to their God every day. And so at the temple, a sacrifice was made every day for the emperor on his behalf. But never did they have to worship the emperor. 
or any of the Roman gods. Now, fast forward to this point. We're in Philippi, we're in a Roman colony where most of the people in this, in this colony are former Roman soldiers who have retired, who have settled there, they've been given land, and somebody's messing with their culture. They are very Roman in Philippi. Colonies were like little Romes. This was where you would, they would export their culture, their language, their customs. When they brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. What are they accusing them of? Two things. They're accusing them of an illegal religion, even though it was legal, and of disturbing our city. Now, we think of this as disturbing the peace. That's what we call it today, right? This actually has origins going back to Rome. One of the things that Rome gave credit to the emperor for was called the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. The emperor provides a peaceful place at the edge of a sword. You will be peaceful or else. The Pax Romana was strictly enforced. You did not do anything to disturb the peace. If you disturbed order, you disturb Rome. Rome is all about order, even more than me. And that's a big deal, because I like order. Rome was way worse. These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They are disturbing the Pax Romana. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. What customs are they advocating? What are they talking about? It's interesting because the very next thing, it says the crowd joined in attacking them. And the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. Everybody piles on. You get this mob mentality. Everybody piles on. Why is everybody so eager to attack these folks? Well, if you go back just a handful of years, you would find that the emperor Claudius had been dealing with a disturbance of the peace in Rome. Among the Jewish community, there was this new teaching that had started to arise, and outside biblical sources talk about this. It, it was about this name, Crestus, which sounds a whole lot like Christ. And this Crestus that everybody's talking about, people began to say, we're going to follow Crestus as the Messiah, the promised one. And others were like, no, we're not going to do that. And they began to fight. And it disturbed the peace. And what is oh so important to the Romans? Order. Peace. And so Claudius did something that had not been done prior. He expelled all the Jews from Rome. All of them. Get out. And they did. Later we're going to meet two of those folks who got expelled from Rome who had settled elsewhere because of the expulsion. You'll meet them later. Their names are Priscilla and Aquila. They were victims of this expulsion. Throughout the Roman Empire, you will find that there is right underneath the waterline, right underneath the surface, you will find there is a very strong anti-Semitism because these Jews did not worship their gods. They did not worship their emperor. They were not part of the program. They weren't following the rules. And this was not okay. And so right under the waterline, you see this anti-Semitism throughout the Roman Empire. And what happens when these business folks bring Paul and the others to the crowd and they say, hey, they're disturbing the peace and they're Jews. What happens? The crowd joins in attacking them because it's right under the waterline. And... The emperor kicked them out. The emperor singled them out. It must be okay. As long as somebody in authority does it, it must be okay, right? As long as, long as they say it or do it, then it must be fine. And they attack them. The magistrates tore the garments off of, this, off of Paul and the team and gave orders to beat them with rods. 
And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Now, what does that mean? Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. A Roman prison typically had rooms on the outside coming in until you had what we would consider the most secure location, which was the center of the prison. No windows, no ventilation, clearly no air conditioning, not invented yet. This was not a good place to be. They were put in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. They have been beaten after they have been stripped and humiliated. And now their feet are in the stocks in one of the most uncomfortable places you can possibly imagine. How would you feel in that moment? God, I was just doing what you told me to do. I was just telling them about Jesus. And this is what I get. Really? This is, this is the reward? I mean, I think that might be how we would feel in that situation, yeah? What are they doing? About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. About midnight, I'm asleep every night. I'm just being real. Right? If I don't get enough sleep, I am not a happy camper to be around. Inside right now, Charlotte is screaming, Amen. <laughs> I need sleep. It is important. It is a part of a rhythm and it is necessary. Some people can do with only three or four hours a night. I envy you. That's amazing. How many more books could I read if I could sleep less? I've tried it. It doesn't work well. Everyone around me wants me to sleep. It is necessary. Midnight, Paul and Silas, after they have been stripped and beaten and fastened in the stocks, what are they doing? They're worshiping. They're praying and they're worshiping God. And the other prisoners are listening to them. Don't miss that. Suddenly there's a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. That's never happened before. All of a sudden they're free. If you were in a Roman prison and there was an earthquake and all the doors swing open and all of your chains fall off, what is the very first thing you're going to do next? Run. Exactly right. You're going to run. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. The reason for that is because a Roman guard if he allowed a prisoner to escape, would be forced to face the same penalty that prisoner would have faced had he not escaped. So if any of these folks are facing the death penalty, say, which was not uncommon, that's what he's going to get. This is why you see the guards who were guarding Jesus' tomb, the Roman guards, right? After the resurrection and Jesus is gone, what happens to them? You remember? They're killed. The prison doors were open. He drew his sword. He's about to kill himself. But Paul cries out with a loud voice, don't harm yourself. We're all here. Wait a minute, what? The doors are open, the chains are gone, and you're all still here? And the jailer called for lights. And he rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out. And he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? This is not normal. You're worshiping, you're praying, everything that's going on here, this is not normal. And then the earthquake and the doors and the chains, and you're still here? This is not normal. How do I get what you have? How do I experience what you have? Because I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand it. 
And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Astounding, right? Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. That's pretty astounding for a Roman jailer to act like that. Only God does that sort of thing. The next morning, when it was day, the magistrates sent the police saying, let those men go. Talking about Paul and his team. Let them go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. Okay. Happy ending to the story. But we're not quite done. Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly uncondemned men who are oops you're not allowed to beat a Roman citizen without a trial that's against the law and you can be killed for that they've beaten us uncondemned, untried men who are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison, and do they now throw us out secretly? No. You don't see Paul do this very much, but there's a reason for it. Let them come themselves and take us out. We're going to need an escort from the ones who sent us here. We'll be right here waiting. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. Oops, we forgot to ask. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So Paul and his team went out of the prison and visited Lydia. And I love that. Get out of the city. They're like... All right, when we're ready. And they go and they visit Lydia and they visit the house church that's hosted there. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and then they departed. And that's where we're going to stop today. So many fascinating things in this passage, don't you think? So many things that just jump right out. Uh, the, the one that I said a minute ago, Paul is singing hymns from the stocks in the inner cell of a jail. I got to tell you, I'm not sure I'd be that guy. I'd like to be that guy. I'm not sure I would be. I think I might be a little grumpier than that after having been beaten within an inch of my life. Particularly knowing that as a Roman citizen, that shouldn't have happened. But the mob mentality caused it. Paul is singing hymns. And and I love what William Barclay says about Paul's attitude and his mindset here. He says, with God, there is freedom even in a prison. He's in jail and he's worshiping God and praying. His feet are locked in the stocks and he's worshiping. That's astounding. That's beyond countercultural. That's counter anything I know as a human. That's very, very different. We talked about Lydia's home being the the center of the house church there in Philippi, the, the beginnings of this church. And I want you to think for just a minute about the church in Philippi. And this is where I really want to zero in for a couple minutes. I want you to think about this church. I want you to think about who is in this church. Who's a part of this? Remember, churches, the the word church does not mean a building, right? It's a movement. And the the church did not have buildings, like dedicated buildings like this one that you're in today, right? They met in homes. 
So Lydia's home is the center. This is where the church is hosted. And, and, and if you look at the church in Philippi so far, just in this chapter of what we've seen so far, we know there are several people who are part of this church. We know you have Lydia, right, and her household, right? They're there. We know that. There's somebody that you may have skipped right over because I have in the past too. But there's somebody else who experiences freedom, freedom from demonic possession. You remember her? The slave girl, right? Where's she going to go? Who is going to welcome her and accept her given everything she's done, everything she's been, everything she's said? Who's going to accept her? I got an idea. I bet Lydia and team said, hey, come on in. You know who else is a part of this? The jailer and his family. Now, I want you to think about these three. I want you to think about them, and I want you to think about who they are, where they come from, what they're doing. Lydia, we talked about last time, Lydia is a Gentile. She's not Jewish. She's a Gentile. She's a businesswoman, very highly successful. She trades in this purple cloth, right? Very expensive, very successful businesswoman. She's a Gentile, she's a successful businesswoman, she's wealthy, and she's a woman. And in this day and time, that's a big deal. The slave girl, she's on the opposite end socioeconomically from Lydia. She has nothing. She has been enslaved, she has been taken advantage of. We don't know how long but it probably was longer than just a few, few months. What, where does she go? Who will bring her and invite her and welcome her? Culturally, no one. And yet, I can see her being a part of this community. The jailer and his family, they come to faith and they're free. And they're part of this community now. See, the Christian life, following Jesus, is not a solo endeavor. It's a community endeavor. It's something we do together. Because none of us have all the gifts, and every one of us needs encouragement. And when one has a bad day, a rough season, somebody else can come alongside. Because they've either been there or they're going to be there. And we encourage and we help one another. We pray for one another and we bear one another's burdens all ways that we do what Jesus taught us to do. The one command that the Apostle Paul would later call the law of Christ. Love one another. This was the hallmark of the early church. This is what Jesus said. This is how people will know you're my followers if you do that. And in all three of these cases, you see people who are unexpected. If you're planting a church in this day and time, you're like, who's our target avatar for our marketing efforts? Would any of these three really have been the center of the bullseye? And they're all there. And they're all welcome. I think Luke, the, the physician who is writing the book of Acts, I believe that he is intentionally highlighting these three. I think he's highlighting these three on purpose because you have a cross-section of society here. You have a wealthy business woman Gentile. You have a slave, former slave girl, young girl. And you have a Roman, a soldier, a jailer. These three normally are not going to hang out together. They're not going over to one another's houses. But Luke highlights these three in this chapter on purpose. And here's what I think his point is. Because Luke is always making a point with what he writes. Any writer in antiquity did this. Writing materials were not cheap. You didn't just write to write. You were very specific about what you would record. And Luke, we've already seen in the first 16 chapters, is recording what he records on purpose for a purpose. Here's what I think his point is in this chapter. Jesus breaks barriers that separate people and he creates a new community where everyone is invited, welcomed, and loved. 
Can you imagine the barriers that would have existed between Lydia and the slave girl? Or Lydia and the Roman jailer? Or the slave girl and the Roman jailer? These were, again, not people who were hanging out at one another's houses. The, the barriers were in place. And we are fantastic at erecting barriers between people. We are fantastic at division, and this is nothing new. We see it in our day. We see it everywhere we look. We are great at creating division. We are great at dividing and saying us and them, whoever us and them are. And that's not new. And it was very, very present in this day. The Roman Empire had status categories. There were classes of people. And almost nobody changed classes. And then one day, there's a movement. And that movement begins to change things. And all of a sudden, wealthy Gentile business women are sitting at the same table sharing a meal with a former slave and a Roman jailer. And Luke, a physician. And Paul, this Jewish rabbi who knows more about the law of Moses than any of us could possibly imagine. And they're sharing a meal. And they're praying for one another and they're encouraging one another. They are loving one another. And this new community that's forming is unlike anything the world has ever seen. Because all those divisions that matter so much out there don't matter in here. Because in here we understand that every person is created in the image of God. No exceptions. That God loves every person he created. No exceptions. That his desire is that every person he created would come to a knowledge of the truth. No exceptions. And this is why we value every single life. No exceptions. You realize how revolutionary this was in the first century. Do you have any idea how this began to change the world? To see people that way, not based on what they had been or what they had done, but to see them as God sees them. Jesus breaks barriers that separate people, and he creates a new community where everybody is invited where everybody's welcomed and where everybody's loved. It's revolutionary. And I know this may seem so simple because in our day, we're so good at this. In our day, we don't, we don't really have those kind of divisions. We don't really see people as anything other than what, this, what I'm describing here. We, we are all about loving one another all the time, particularly in politics, right? We never demonize. We never divide. Have I moved to meddling yet? Here's the thing. This is what Jesus started, and it changed the world. This is what he started. And in Philippi, this is where it begins with these people. And later, Paul's going to write a letter back to, to this church. And we have it in the New Testament. It's called the book of Philippians. That's a letter to this church sometime later that has grown. Why on earth would this little church grow? Because they began to tell other people about Jesus. They began to invite them to experience what they had invited, what they had experienced. They began to invite them in. I know you, you may not believe what we believe yet, but come and see. Come and see. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Come and see. And more and more people began to gather. 
And the church began to grow. And Philippi would never be the same. And that is the vision for this church. Because this hasn't changed. We live in a day that is more divided and more polarized than any time in my lifetime that I can remember. We live in a day and time where people speak to and about one another in almost unfathomable ways. Whether they're hiding behind a keyboard or standing in front of a microphone. But as people who follow Jesus, this is the center of the bullseye for us. This is what the new community is about. There are no exceptions to this. And I need you to hear that, and I need you to know that, because we're coming into a very highly contentious season. And I need you to understand that as we are in this season culturally, a season that has so much darkness, it's time to be the light. That's how Jesus described you. You remember? He said, you are the light of the world. It's time to do that. How do we do that? How can we do that? Just like this, just like they did, just like Lydia and this girl and this jailer did. One person at a time. Come and see. I, I know you may not believe what I believe yet. That's okay. Just come check it out. Just come and see. And see what God will do through you when you live that kind of life. When you live with open hands saying, God, everything you put in my life is from you including every relationship and every conversation. Take me and use me and see what God will do through you, even in a season of darkness. Are you up for that? Are you up for that? This is my challenge to you. I'm not kidding. This season that we're that we're in, that we're going to see for the rest of this year, this is, this is going to be contentious. This is going to be challenging, particularly in a place like the DMV. And we have an opportunity here to shine light in the middle of that darkness. We have the opportunity to show people a Jesus who breaks barriers that separate people. We have the opportunity to show people a Jesus who creates a new community where Everybody is invited and welcomed and loved, no matter where they've been or what they've done. You and I have that opportunity. What are we going to do with it? I say it's time to step up. I say it's time to get real and get intentional here. Say, God, what do you want to do next? Let me pray for us in this. Heavenly Father, it is not hard to look around us and see so much division and in some cases so much hatred. We see anti-Semitism in so many places, but that's not the only thing we see. And Father, you have called us as followers of Jesus to be different, to live different, to lead different. but we get to choose. We get to choose who we're going to be. We get to choose what we're going to speak. We get to choose what we're going to do. We get to choose. My prayer for each one of us is that we would choose to follow Jesus. That just like Jesus we would be about creating community where barriers are broken down. That just like Jesus, we would be opposed to anything that separates people. That just like Jesus, we would be about creating a community where everyone knows they are invited 
They are welcomed and they are loved. This is my prayer for your church in this place. This is my prayer for your people. May we stay focused in a difficult season. I pray all of this for us and over us in the name of Jesus. Amen.